The Leech is basically a fortified 2x1 that thanks to its tier 3 workbench can be used for the whole wipe. One of the striking features are those up to 4 auto turret pods. When they are open, they turn the base into an area denial station, which practically provides you with a compound but without the walls. It works amazingly well if you play with allies out of separate but co-located bases. However, when I conceived the leech, auto turrets did not require electricity and the base did not include a minicopter hangar. Since minicopters are so important nowadays, I resorted to adding another 2x1 on top of the roof exit to serve as hangar more than once, which made the base look really top heavy and awkward. The good news is, it's 2020 and I'm back. Meet the Leech 2. It features a hyper efficient main loot room for your items, two lockers for your PvP gear sets, a tier 3 workbench, which means you can craft all the endgame items, a refined drop down chute with a window protected entrance to the core, the possibility to close off said chute with a stability bunker seal. A shooting floor with view to all sides, three exits, one on each side and one on the roof, a fully fledged out electric circuit, up to four external auto turrets which cover all angles around the base, and a neatly integrated minicopter hangar with automated hangar doors. As you can see, every nook and cranny of the space is used. This results into an endgame base with a phenomenally low build and upkeep cost in particular regarding metal fragments and high quality metal, so that your wipe won't just consist of farming upkeep. The raid stats have been buffed and it now takes 15 rockets to reach main loot and 19 rockets to reach the TC, which is pretty decent for a base that's basically a honeycomb 2x1. Let's take a tour. Arriving with a minicopter, the Christmas lights on the landing pad guide us in. The garage door opens automatically. Shotgun traps make sure that no one is following us. This locker allows to quickly change gear sets if, for example, you like to use the minicopter to fly into the snow biome to farm. The roof itself is kept frugal to keep cost and upkeep down. Still, it's fully accessible and those concrete barriers provide a decent amount of protection. Those peak downs allow to spot and engage door campers and prevent easy head jumping onto the roof. This chute leads down to the second floor of the base. This switch disables the automatic door in case that's necessary. Behind this window we find one of the auto turrets. This window allows to service the auto turret from within the safety of the base. And while it is still possible to manually open the garage doors from here, they are now electrified as well. The second floor is a mix of utility room and, depending on the type of window, shooting floor or outlook. If you upgrade the base fully, there are four auto turrets that give you full coverage around the base. The second floor has two exits. Each of them is covered by the auto turrets, which makes it extremely hard to door camp this base. The roof stability seal blocks the chute that leads into the core of the base. From a recent video of my gaming experience, you may have learned how to easily break into the most standard design of stability bunkers. But no worries, this type of stability seal is safe. To unseal the bunker, you spawn inside of the core and destroy this twig half wall. Since the twig is located deep inside of the core, it cannot be reached by splash damage. With the roof gone, the chute that connects to the core and the second floor is no longer blocked. Down in the chute, we are surrounded by three window frames. Behind those two, we find a tier 2 workbench and the large battery. The entrance to the core has now become a window as well. The reason is that window frames are more likely to absorb splash damage, such as from rockets or grenades launched down the chute, which will keep the core more protected in case of a raid. Undrainable shotgun traps guard the chute in case the roof seal is not in place. In this section we find a bed, the tier 3 workbench, furnaces and the electrical control panel. These four switches trigger the auto turrets. These four switches allow to remotely open and close the auto turret pods. Behind this window we find the first locker. It is protected from 8 rockets so keep your less important gear sets here. Behind the garage door we find the main loot room. 
Thanks to the clever use of barbecues as well as small and large boxes, this loot room can hold the equivalent of up to two traditional loot rooms. Behind this wall we find the locker that is protected from at least 16 rockets. Keep your best gear sets here. And behind this window we find the TC. It sits in an armored triangle that ensures that if raiders want to loot it, they have to invest at least 19 rockets. If you follow the content of my fellow base builder Twisited, you may have just recently learned about the weakness of TCs behind reinforced window glass. They can be vulnerable to incendiary rockets, so I want to spend a bit of time discussing this. The issue is that the fire can spread through the glass and destroy the TC. I made a few tests and found that vertical embrasures in combination with those floors at half height in many cases prevent the fire from spreading into the TC compartment. It's not a perfect solution as eventually the fire will melt away the embrasures, yet it makes raiders have to spend multiple incendiary rockets, which they might not have, and in order to retrieve the loot they still need to go through a sheet metal wall. In summary, let's stay vigilant regarding incendiary rockets, but it's too early to panic. Let's jump into the build. Although it is preferable that you start out with a reinforced glass window BP, the base can easily be built from scratch at the start of a wipe. If you want to be sure that you can build the base, lay out the footprint now. It's a 2x1 at the core, surrounded by triangles. The square foundations are for the roof ramps that will lead up to the entrances. Locate the triangle next to the square and create the TC compartment. Place the TC at the front right of the triangle to ensure that it will remain accessible. If you do not have reinforced glass windows yet, use wooden window bars for now. On the adjacent square and triangle, build a compartment for your starter items. The double door should open towards the other square. We extend the base along the next square and these two triangles. Use a wooden double door frame to form your first airlock. Leave it wood, as you will later have to hatchet it out. Use your first metal fragments to replace the door with sheet metal doors. Place your tier 1 workbench into this triangle. Move your sleeping bags in front of the double door. Once you can craft two large boxes and three barbecues, clear out the inner one by one. Put down a twig wall in front of the furnaces to aid with the placement of the boxes. Place the barbecue as accurately in the center as you can. The two large boxes should fit on either side. In front of each of the large boxes, place a barbecue and a small box. I recommend to rotate the small box so that the small side is facing you. While this might require to pick up the box when you want to replace the door, it makes the large boxes easier to access. By the way, this loot room already contains as much space as a traditional 4 box loot room plus a small box. This is the starter unit done. Once you have one spare furnace, upgrade the three triangles in front of the outer door. Build two temporary twig walls in front of the door. Place the furnace into the corner and use it to jump onto the roof. Here we build a chute entrance with a window and a floor triangle at half height. If you have trouble jumping out of the chute, press F1, click on console on the top left and type input.autocrouch true. To get onto the base, run to this triangle, upgrade the foundation and create a step at half height. This half height triangle is vital to later complete the main loot room. Next farm up to get the outer shell of the base set up. Since you may not be able to reach parts of the TC compartment later, you need to upgrade it to armored before closing it in with the honeycombing. Destroy the adjacent twig foundation and upgrade the foundation below the TC to armored. Then upgrade this wall to armored and close off the triangle with stone. Do the same on the other side of the TC. Place a roof ramp next to that last triangle. Then walk around the base, upgrade each remaining triangle to stone and enclose it with stone walls. Use the roof ramp to get onto the second floor and close off the gaps in the ceiling with stone. We now upgrade the second floor to have a safe way in and out of the base. 
place two single door frames on the tips of those triangles and add in sheet metal doors. On each of the triangle tips, place wall frames and double doors. These will later become the auto turret compartments. If you find four auto turrets excessive, replace these two wall frames with regular windows. In this video, however, I will show you the maxed out version. Then surround the rest of the base, including the space in front of the auto turret compartments with window frames. Add some kind of protection, such as wooden window bars. Upgrade this floor tile opposite of the chute to armored. This is where the TC compartment is located. Then we do a little upgrade to push the final minimum rate cost to 19 rockets by adding two half walls and a floor tile. On top of that triangle we build another jump up that leads to the roof. Optionally place a door frame in the center of the base to split the two sides. This can be very helpful during a firefight to seek cover. Now close off the rest of the ceiling with stone. Remember that this second floor is your friend if you seek space for the repair bench or the research table. Here is the suggested order of the upgrades. First, replace all double doors apart from those in the auto turret compartments to garage doors. Then replace the furnace with a ladder to get in and out of the core of the base. Replace all the wooden window bars with reinforced glass windows or maybe metal window bars if you prefer to be able to shoot out of the base. Once you can afford a tier 2 workbench, place it against the wall into the triangle right of the chute. Close it off with a stone framed window. Close off the other side with the same type of window. Once you got the BP and 50 high qual, place a large battery behind that window. You can still reach the power input and output, even though they are not visible. Another option to ultimately make the base safer is not to place those window frames and later, once the battery is connected and the tier 3 workbench is placed, seal off those triangles with solid sheet metal walls. However, this requires to leave this side weaker for a longer period of time or to soft side out two window frames. Move the furnaces into the corner opposite of the chute entrance. Use a half wall to make sure that all three of them fit tightly into the corner. Upgrade the foundation and the walls of this triangle to sheet metal and place a locker there. Close off the triangle with window frames. Another locker goes into this triangle. A word about lockers. You can buy them at Bandit Camp for 45 scrap and even research them there for another 75 scrap if you have trouble finding them in the wild. Further, you might be worried about what happens if they get destroyed. Rust Daddy showed me that they can be replaced from within the triangle. You will block yourself in, but you can use the locker to transfer out the remaining items on your body. Once that second locker is in place, you can add the second roof ramp. Since the sides of the roof are sticking into the locker compartment, they will unfortunately prevent placing the locker afterwards. Thus, I would not code lock this locker. Rather let the raiders have the loot but leave the locker intact. Now it's time to upgrade building blocks to their final tier. Upgrade those four floor tiles to armored. Inside of the core, upgrade everything you can reach to sheet metal. Some people ask me why I don't build my bases in the final build tier. That's simple. In game, you usually don't have a lot of metal fragments in the beginning, so all building is done in stone. And if the upgrades are not factored into the build steps, you may end up with parts that should be upgraded, but are no longer accessible, leaving you with a base with weak spots. Run outside and upgrade the two triangles below the airlock to sheet metal as well. On the second floor, make sure that the chute as well as the window next to the jump up to the roof are upgraded to sheet metal as well. 
Now we will complete the core. In the main loot room, add a square floor tile at half height. Then, best remove the sleeping bags in front of it and add another floor tile at half height to make the box placement easier. Then, simply mirror the placement of the lower compartment. You will end up with a loot room that gives you more space than two traditional loot rooms. Now take a few machetes and soft side the wooden door frame. Place two small boxes into the chute. Then close it off with another window frame. There are several reasons for choosing a window frame over a garage door as in the original design. First of all, the window frame can be closed off with reinforced glass, which ensures that raids to the main loot room from this side cost a minimum of 15 rockets. Second, since we use undrainable traps, the window frame will absorb splash damage from grenades or rockets exploding on the bottom of the chute. Thus raiders have to take much more risky positions to effectively damage the traps. Third, during an online raid, a broken glass window is much faster to patch than a broken door. In case you are solo, the window frame combines perfectly with a bed in order to quickly crawl in and out of the core. Otherwise put back your sleeping bags. Once you get a level 3 workbench, you can place it into the square in front of the loot room. Accurate placement is extremely important. Best clean out the bed or the sleeping bags first. Rotate the workbench with the R key so that the back side is facing you. Then place it as far to the right and to the back as possible. If you rotate it back with your hammer, it should leave enough space for the roof seal. And if you ever need to replace the window frame in front of the chute, simply rotate the tier 3 workbench again with your hammer. Don't forget to place back the bed. One important concept you see in most of my bases since the original Frustrator are undrainable shotgun traps. Unfortunately, the roof seal and the tier 3 workbench limit the options for placing those. One shotgun trap can go above the furnaces. However, its forward foot needs to remain behind that line, otherwise it will block the roof seal from placing. I will place it a little bit to the right, so that you can still sit on the furnaces, which can be helpful during an online raid. Unfortunately, from this position, it won't trigger for raiders that stay far back in the chute. As a remedy to that, a second shotgun trap can be attached to the door frame of the main loot room. It will fire, even if the garage door is closed. If you want to go one step further, swap out this barbecue and small box for another shotgun trap. The trap will be hidden until raiders blow through the garage door and therefore forms a second line of defense. This completes the core of the base. Next, we'll turn our attention skywards. We all know how vital minicopters have become. Thus, the ability to store a minicopter is an important feature of any base. When Old Fool and I played out of the first version of the base, we actually added a minicopter hangar on top of the roof exit, which gave the base a very awkward look. In this version, we will integrate the minicopter hangar with the roof access, which yields a much more elegant and affordable solution. To do that, get onto the roof. On both ends of the 2x1, place a garage door. You could use a wall or a window instead of the second garage door, but then on occasion you might not be able to mount the minicopter if it ends up too close to the forward wall. On the opposite side of the roof exit, we place another locker. I found lockers near minicopters always useful to, for example, quickly switch to snow biome farming gear. I would use window frames to close off the rest of the 2x1. I just value the additional situation awareness that they can provide. However, feel free to just use walls instead. In front of one of the garage doors, build a hexagon as minicopter landing pad. The Christmas lights can be a great way to provide guidance during night landings. Unlike in version 1, those triangles now block the path to the other side of the roof. Place one triangle at the center of each of the long sides of the base. They allow to jump to the other side of the roof. On the other tip, place two more triangles like this. To give you cover from ground fire without increasing the upkeep cost, use concrete barriers. It can help to use temporary twig triangles to place them more conveniently. While the roof isn't particularly strong, it gives you a lot of mobility and a decent amount of cover for a base this size. 
And by the way, feel free to just mirror the landing pad on the other side of the base if you prefer that. To make the roof entrance a bit safer, I recommend to guard at least one of the garage doors with one or two shotgun traps. Another shotgun trap can go into that sneaky corner of the roof entrance. A barbecue and a small box serve as drop chests. The hangar is also a great place for a few extra bags such as for your allies and less active team members. Lastly, let's turn towards the auto turrets. Since auto turrets now require electricity, we'll have to take care of the power supply first. Get onto the roof and start spamming solar panels. My tests showed that 8 solar panels facing north are sufficient to keep the full electric circuit running without interruptions. By using Rust Daddy's trick of placing them into each other, you should easily be able to fit all of them on top of the minicopter hangar. To bundle their energy output, place three groups of root combiners inside of the hangar. One group of four, one of two and a single one. Connect each solar panel with one of the root combiners of the group of four. Then run their outputs into the next two root combiners and the outputs of those two into the single root combiner. Fortunately, since my last video, it has become much easier to work with batteries. We can simply run the output from all the solar panels into the battery's power in. The battery will continue to replenish its charge even if the power out is connected to a consumer. Back in the core above the furnaces, place another root combiner. Run the output of the large battery into one of its inputs. Add one branch and one switch for each auto turret. Connect the root combiner to the first branch. Chain the branches so that the power out runs into the power in of the next one. For each of the branches, set the branch out value to 11 and connect it to the switch below. For each auto turret compartment, do the following steps. Replace all remaining double doors with garage doors. Place the turret onto the ground and authorize. Then run a cable to one of the switches. Those switches allow to turn off the auto turrets to refill them. For no extra electricity cost, you can also add a light and connect them to the turret's output that indicate low ammo or target acquired. To put the turret in and out of action, open the garage doors by pointing at the rollers sticking through the walls. My recommendation would be to combine the windows behind the turrets with wooden shutters and either reinforce glass or metal bars to protect you inside the base while the turrets are active. Next, let's automate the hangar door. Add a fifth electrical branch, connect it from the previous one and set it to 3. Place a switch in the chute on the way to the roof and connect it to that branch. Attach a heartbeat sensor to the wall frame of the hangar door. Place it quite far to the right. This way you break line of sight fastest when you jump down the chute. Make sure to set it to exclude others, otherwise players without TC authorization can simply walk into your base. Connect it to a door controller that you need to pair with a garage door. If done correctly, you will need to open the door manually from the inside and it closes automatically once you're out of range of the heartbeat sensor. The switch allows you to kill the whole system in case you want to avoid opening the garage door by accident. Next, I show you how to electrify the garage doors of the auto turret pods. Above the furnaces on the other wall, place four more electrical branches and switches. Connect them as usual, run the power out from the previous electrical branch into the power in of the next one. Connect the branch out to the respective switch and set the branch value to 4. Head to the second floor. Above each of the window frames behind the auto turret pods, place a splitter. Next to the rollers of the garage door, place one of the door controllers each. Connect the door controllers to the splitter outputs, then connect the splitter to the switch to provide the system with electricity. Head back upstairs and remove all nearby window shutters. They tend to make it very difficult to pair the garage doors. Unlock the code locks of the garage doors and pair the door controllers. Remember that the doors have to be closed in order to pair successfully. If the switch was on, they should open automatically. Make sure to lock the code locks again. Then replace the window shutters. 
The beauty of this electrical setup is that the most crucial elements, the turrets, have priority in receiving electricity. This means, if energy runs low, the garage doors will shut first before the turrets go offline, leaving them in a protected state. If you sacrifice a few boxes, you can fit two generators into the core, one into the loot room and one into the chute, for example. The two generators deliver 80 units of power, which is enough to keep the whole circuit running. You simply need to merge their outputs with the output of the large battery. A few final touches and we're done with the second iteration of the leech. As with every base, I recommend to add at least one or two external TCs. They can be the difference between losing your loot and losing the whole base. I would recommend to surround the walls with some type of barricades. They will make it harder to ladder onto the base as well as to hug the walls to hide from the auto turrets. Further, always remember that bases work best in concert. If you need a large furnace, build a large furnace base next door. If you need an oil refinery, build a small refinery base. If you have too much loot, build an external loot base. Use those bases to claim more land for yourself and your group. The more land you control, the more risky raids become. And that's it for the Leech 2. With that second iteration, you get a base that is sturdier than its predecessor without increased cost. It elegantly adapts to the new metas of electricity and minicopters. Thanks to its tier 3 workbench, it can be your friend from the beginning to the end of the wipe, be it as a home for a more casual wipe or as a flanking base. May it bring you safely through the wipe. Until then, Evil Wurst out.